So welcome to the episode of Locked In. In this episode, I'm gonna be actually doing a little different spin on what I normally create for this channel. And I know you probably already realized that this video length is super, super long, but let me take a second to explain so you know what to expect in this episode. So if you don't follow me on Instagram, I actually recently posted about doing a presentation for the South Illinois University about my channel and they had a bunch of other really cool speakers that were there and they considered me a full-time professional YouTuber. So I wanted to basically talk to the students about a little bit about the history of my channel, a little bit about the rebranding because I was actually originally called a different name than Locked In if you didn't know that depending on how long you've been subscribed or been watching my channel. As well as I talked about actually a little bit about the behind the scenes on how I actually film all of my videos, the exact equipment I use, what my studio apartment actually looks like, even though this might look like a studio setting. This is my 500 square foot studio that I live in. So if you wanna hear a little bit more about the background of my channel and a little bit about how I actually film that, please stay tuned and watch this video. I'm gonna be cutting it up just a little bit. Then at the end there, there is a long question and answer section, a little bit about the more technical side of how I actually edit and things like that. And then just general questions about starting a YouTube channel or what I think about YouTube as well as my thoughts on calling myself a YouTuber. So if you wanna watch all that, please stay till the very end. I really do appreciate it. But if you wanna hear just a quick snippet of the channel, that is essentially in the first 20 or so minutes of this video, and then it kinda of rolls into questions and answers after that. So I really do appreciate it. If you wanna help support this channel so I can create more content for you guys, please make sure to check out my merch in the Spreadshirt in the links below. You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram, as well as support the channel on Patreon. But let's get this live stream started. All right, welcome everybody to Brand U at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. I'm Craig Ingstrom. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Studies here in the program. And today we have a really special treat. We have Michael from Locked In, who runs a YouTube channel uh, geared at cyclists. He also is part of a three-party stream that happens pretty much once a week on Alternative Cycling Network. It's what is called ACN. So he's got a lot of experience with YouTubing, and we really wanted to invite somebody that could talk a little bit more about the technical things that we're doing here uh, and the, like, you know, what students can do more technically if they want to be creators. I think, you know, what this is really about is you sh talking a little bit about your channel and, uh, you know, how it's growing, how you got started, you know, where you're doing it from, how you're doing it and all those things. So I'm just going to let you uh, go ahead and, and start telling us those things. Cool. So I, uh, I'm trying to make this as official as possible and made a little PowerPoint. So I'm going to go over in this first part of this is a little bit about the history of my channel and how YouTube really was in the beginning to where it is now. I've had to rebrand as well as going over just the technical aspect of the actual equipment that I used to film it and the exact camera kind of setup and kind of letting you into the studio, which is uh, my studio apartment that I live in. Um, so I'm basically gonna get started with uh, the history of it. My channel used to be actually be called my spikes. That was how I initially started it. I started making random videos uh, with an old flip cam from back in the day. And I just did it as a creative outlet during college, uh, just to have something to do. I then kind of progressed and eventually really liked doing it and kind of learned how to do the editing process from one of my close personal friends at the time who was going actually to college for editing and is still an, a video editor. And so learning how to actually edit originally in Final Cut Pro and then Adobe Premiere from him got me the interest into basically stepping up my video equipment game and starting to do, you know, more serious YouTube videos. And so this is a little shot of my old logo, <laughs> this old intro I used to have that and some of the old videos I have um, that have done really well on the channel that have been there for a long time. I essentially bought a Canon T2i, which was like the first kind of DSLR that had HD video quality. And this is, you know, 10 or 11 ish years ago. And at the time, HD content was very rare. And that was something that I really wanted to get into to kind of separate myself as well as I was somebody who was a college student that didn't make a lot of money. So I couldn't afford to go have a ton of stuff done to my bike to fix it. So I bought a set of tools and was just like, okay, I'm going to learn how to do, you know, my basic repairs. And during that process, obviously nowadays you just say, oh, go YouTube it. Well, back then it was a lot slimmer of things to watch. And a lot of the videos were just really boring back in the day. They were your guy that would just set up his camera, you know, at the end of the garage and film himself. And it would be a 40 minute video of him swapping out your pedals, which should take 30 seconds. And so 
after kind of getting annoyed with it and learning more things, I was like, okay, well, I can do this kind of format, but in a more concise way in high def, better shots, close ups, things like that to basically get the point across in the least amount of time so that you can be, you know, efficiently learning something or showing off stuff like that. And so that's really where the channel started. Uh, I grew it with the Mike Spikes tag name to about 16,000 subscribers. And that, you know, back in the day, I was only doing maybe two videos a month and, and getting pretty good regular viewage, especially for the time frame. And when I finally released my How to Paint Your Bike part one and part two that you can see here and here, uh, I released those videos. And this is pre YouTube actually paying anyone to make video content. They actually contacted me and said, hey, we're starting this thing called the partner program. Would you be interested in monetizing this video? Not the channel, not not all my videos, just this video specifically because it had received, I believe about 5,000 views within a week or so. And for YouTube, especially back then, that was a pretty good return on any kind of video, especially from a small no-name channel like mine was. And they basically gave me a list of, of what you get now of how to monetize it means no copyright music, things like that. So I said, yes, awesome. I'd love to make some money doing this. And every single video I uploaded from that point on, I had to essentially submit for them to manually monetize. And so that is something that was originally created when I was kind of at the beginning of this. Um, the channel was doing pretty well. I wasn't taking it super seriously. And then I unfortunately had to uh, rebrand because there is a small bike shop named Mike's Bikes that eventually you know, started a YouTube channel. I was unaware of them. They have, I believe, six stores um, total in the nation and basically sent me a cease and desist. So uh, YouTube wanted to kill my channel. I had reached out to them and basically told them like, hey, I'd love to work with you. I was unaware of this. I have 16,000 subscribers in this small growing community and your channel has like 300 and you have like one video. So can we work together, co-brand, you know, basically something that now is so seemingly obvious, but back then this was, you know, oh, why would I want to promote on YouTube? That was not a thing like it is now. They were very uninterested and said, no, I had them reach out to YouTube and say, tell them that we're going to work together and figure something out to where I rebranded and had to re-upload all the videos that I had done at that point and remove my intros and outros saying Mike Spikes. And then I could change it to the name of Locked In, which is kind of a play on clipping into your bike or pedaling and had to rebrand everything from, from the ground up. And that definitely was a big struggle uh, because, you know, I'm starting from scratch and Mike's bikes was so catchy and easy to remember. A lot of people just could remember to search it. Um, so I did have to go through that kind of phase for the channel. And then throughout the years, it was always something I did pretty regularly. Um, I would take time off periodically and not make videos, let's say for, you know, a summer or something. And I called it like my season break. Um, but I've essentially been doing this, you know, pretty regularly, almost weekly for the last, I'd say two or three years, um, every other week at minimum or every week. And then due to everything that's going on in the world, this is now my full-time gig. And so that is basically what's going to roll me into what I use. A lot of people think that you need this crazy allotment of camera equipment, but realistically you can create anything. And I'm gonna show you my, again, my studio setup uh, very shortly, but this is essentially all that I use. And this is my main camera that I'm actually shooting this live stream with that I'm using essentially as a webcam for better video quality is the same camera that I use for when I do my uh, pieces to camera, talking about a review or a bicycle or a story or anything like that. And that's the A6500. Um, that's Sony's mirrorless camera. It's not their most expensive. There's definitely a lot nicer that they have, but this gets the job done and it has certain features that have been gonna great for if you are wanting to have one camera that has image stabilization and things like that, as well as replaceable lenses, so you can swap them out easily. Uh, there's definitely some pros and cons to this camera that I can get into in the questions and answers if you have specifically. My B camera is essentially an old a6500. Uh, okay, and I guess uh, someone wants to know the specs of the main camera. So the A6500, they started this series where the body is essentially the same from the A6000, but this is Sony's mirrorless camera. It does have a, a their E-mount lens system. This does shoot in 4K at 30 frames per second. They do have lower resolutions where you can up the frame rate. So if you want to do like a slow mo um, or anything like that, you can do down to 1080p. This does have image stabilization built into the body, meaning if you want to use an older 
uh, vintage lens or just you know a prime lens or anything that's slightly more affordable, your lens does not have to have image stabilization so that you can essentially save money doing that because it's built in the body. And so that's definitely a, a pro for me because I do use it handheld quite a bit when shooting certain parts of my videos that again, we'll get into in the last slide for this presentation. Then we go into my B camera, which is my A6000, which is essentially a really old version of this. It uses the same mounting system for the lens, so I can reuse all my lenses between the two cameras. This one only shoots in uh, 1080p. I mainly use it for photography when I'm on the bike, but it works great as a B camera for when I wanna film, let's say the, the table that I'm actually have below here that my laptop is resting on, so I can shoot any product close-ups while doing that. Then I have my my riding camera essentially because I, I was I looked for a long time of what to use for vlogs or something that would have great image stabilization for riding. And at the time I picked up a DJI uh, Osmo that does shoot 4K up to 30 frames or sorry, up to 60 frames and you can go higher frame rate in the lower resolutions. But I love that camera because essentially what they did is they took the the gimbal or head off of you know their DJI drones, which are very stable and put it onto a really lightweight convenient stick style uh, package. So I use that for riding shots as well as that's a great camera to give to friends because since it has a gimbal, no matter how they're moving their hands around, uh, the shot is very, very stable. So it's very easy if you do need to, you know, ask for a friend's help to get a couple of shots. Then my POV camera is actually an old GoPro Hero. I'd love to get a new one. This is like a, I think it's a Hero 3. So that essentially I just put on a bite mount that I can put in my mouth because I don't like carrying the big uh, bulky chest mount for riding shots. So I use that and a, a mouthpiece bite that you use for like swimming to do those kind of shots so that if my head moves, the camera moves with it, it's a little bit more dynam dynamic. And then lastly, I have uh, how I record audio, which is obviously this is mic'd in because I'm doing a live stream. But if I'm recording myself, I have a Zoom H1 uh, audio recorder you can use the built-in mic or plug in a lavalier mic, which is typically what I do for my videos now, so that if something does get in front of my face or my hands where I used to have the microphone kind of off camera, like this setup, uh, the audio would kind of, you know, obviously be affected because of that. So having a lav mic is really nice, as well as I have started doing videos in my patio or outside and still getting that great audio quality, not having to do a voiceover after uh, is very convenient. And then uh, next we have here, my studio. So this is the glitz and the glam of the full-time YouTuber space. Uh, this is my studio apartment. This is literally the whole thing. Uh, on the left there, that's my pantry and my kitchen. Uh, I am currently sitting in the couch that's below the bicycle with all the cycling hats that you're seeing right here. And then this right there, that's my bed. And then at the end there, there's my curtain and my front door. So that's realistically how big my space is. And do I have to get creative on how I shoot this kind of stuff? Totally. But it's something that, again, how I'm shooting this, a lot of people, whenever I do Zooms or consultations that I do offer for my Patreon supporters, they're really shocked that this is literally where I, you know, this is not a, a separate room or a studio space or, you know, an office or anything that I have. It is literally my living room. And again, to draw the curtain away, this is literally what it looks like uh, doing this live stream right now. This is essentially what I have. I don't have uh, a table in my place because I have obviously a, an island for my kitchen. So I have a piece of wood with some linoleum on the top that's white. I put it between two of my uh, chairs for a table surface for, again, my B-roll shots of product uh, showing. And then because I want my laptop closer to where my camera lens is, I put it on a, a box I got from the 99 cent store. And a couple of adapters later, here we are. And uh, this is uh, this is the end result that you can get. Again, trying to be a little creative, you know, and working with what you have. This could be totally done on an iPhone. And actually that does look even better than what my webcam currently in my old MacBook that I'm, I'm using right now as a monitor. It looks better than that camera does. So again, you don't have to have fancy DSLRs and plug in with conversion boxes and everything to get a decent amount of con or decent quality of content or live stream. But obviously this is something I do regularly. So it's something that was worth investing into. And lastly here, I wanted to basically have a video that I wanted to show off that essentially is a culmination of all the shots that we've been talking about in equipment. So I'm gonna let this kind of play in the background. So that's, that's me, that's me talking to the camera. And all these shots are done with, again, the equipment that was shown. So this is the end result of essentially when I shoot myself. So I do have uh, my H1 Zoom mic that I have a lavalier mic that is clipped on my t-shirt that I have obviously off camera. Um, these, all the be beauty shots you're gonna be seeing here for the detail pieces are going to be with my A6500. 
we can get into again, more camera specs, but this is predominantly shot on my 30 millimeter Sigma lens, um, which is a prime lens. And this is where I'm, I'm talking about the specs of the bike. So I'm obviously showing off details. I mentioned certain components. So I make sure to get, you know, uh, shots for each component of the bike that I'm going to be mentioning later down the line to basically show off, you know, the, again, the beauty shots of the entire bike. Then it's going to get into, you know, different shots that I've shot with different equipment of how to show off, you know, my review of this product. The reason why I'm showing a bicycle here is because it is the hardest reviews and most time consuming that I do and basically has to use my entire gamut of equipment to effectively show off a, a high quality review, in my opinion, for something that is complex. A bicycle is not a part or a product that you're going to, you know, simply just use in one aspect, it's obviously multifaceted. So that's where, you know, I, I try to use all of my equipment to show those components off effectively so that you understand, you know, what you're buying, because obviously this is a more dramatic purchase. And for most people, you know, this bike being very affordable for the category is still eight ninety nine, and that's still a decent amount of money, obviously. So it is something that I try to get across of what you're getting into the pros and the cons for it. So these shots here, these are actually shot on my Osmo pocket. Um, I did reframe them and obviously edit them. This POV shot again is my old GoPro hero that has like no image stabilization, but your body and your head is actually pretty good as a gimbal. So it does smooth it out. Um, these shots basically because the Osmo again has that great gimbal head. I basically just gave it to my buddy and said, Hey, we're just going to ride an area that's not super technical, obviously. Um, and he just followed me and I just told him like, yeah, just record me as we ride. And I, I kind of coached him and now he's been better about it. This is a, my GoPro mounted on my handlebar kind of like I've seen this shot done by bike radar and other video reviews. So, you know, learning, watching different creators inspires you and gives you ideas like, oh, that's a good mountain spot, mounting spot that I would have never thought of. So these are essentially a mix of all D the, my DJI Osmo shots as well. Either if I'm holding the camera, obviously for the close ups while riding or my friend is. And then uh, anything that's mounted, hard mounted, or again, the POV shot is all done on my GoPro. And so this is kind of what you come up with. You you basically always want to record way more content than you ever think you're gonna, going to. I tell people, if if you're going to do it, try to do a 10 minute video, you're, you're going to at least need an hour of footage minimum to make that, you know, look good and be interesting to watch and not just one single shot. So I definitely overshoot so that when I'm talking about certain things, I have ideally some footage that will reference what I'm discussing for bike wise. Obviously, if it's braking, I want to have a shot of me doing a hard braking stop. If I'm talking about, you know, how good the ride quality is, I want a shot of me going over some rough stuff. So slightly mapping those things out after doing it or understanding what you want to do with your video content, no matter if it's bicycles, cars or anything else, knowing kind of what you're going to talk about is going to help guide you in what information and things you need to film. So that is basically it. I am going to pause this. That is something that again, I've, I've been doing this for a while. I've learned some things. YouTube has definitely dramatically changed since again, me being pre partner program to where it is now as a platform. Uh, and again, something that now people just say, Oh, just go YouTube it. And that's, that's a, you know, that's a thing. So, so yeah. Great, thank you for that awesome presentation. Hi, Michael. Thank you for the information. It was just very, very helpful. I never knew that you could just create your own YouTube channel in your in your a hotel, well, not hotel, your room like that. Like you are yeah. in between your bed and your kitchen. And <laughs> yeah, it's right here. Yeah. I would just think it a looks fancy like a hotel, room. right? I would say yeah. that it's like this little mini right. hotel. Yeah. <laughs> So my question is, when did you feel comfortable calling yourself a YouTuber or do you still feel comfortable ever? Uh, yeah, uh, that is something that uh, I have officially because of everything going on. This is essentially my full time gig. I am, you know, looking for other work uh, that does pay better. <laughs> uh, but currently I yeah, the only way I make income currently is through my YouTube videos and anyone who supports my uh, channel, either with merch sales or via Patreon. Um, that's how I'm making money currently. And so it's something that I think now, especially people understand that YouTube can be a career. I am by no means a six figure, you know, <laughs> maker on YouTube, uh, by any long shot, I'd love to be. So everyone please go subscribe and, <laughs> and watch all my videos 10 times in a row. Uh, but that is something that it's, 
it's definitely more accepted now than it was before because again i've been kind of at the beginning of the paid process of this to where yeah there's there's people who make crazy amounts of money on this to where it is a actual if you invest in our you know not wasting your money properly like you can definitely make a career out of this um and so now i think it's more acceptable uh because it's my only source of income and somebody's like oh what are you doing uh, instead of saying I'm, I'm unemployed, I can say, oh, I'm a YouTuber. So, <laughs> you know, it is uh, definitely a notch up there, but it's it's something that, again, I think is is more socially acceptable because there are people, again, who are making more than my salary, you know, sales rep pharmaceutical job I had before. Uh, and they could be making that kind of salary daily uh, with some of the people that have the high end view. So I think that's something that, um, again, is more socially accepted now um, to where I'm coming to more terms with it, I guess. Thank you. Sandy, oh yeah, trust me, Sandy, I, I've tried to learn as many as I can because again, you can make seemingly quality content with you know whatever you have at home. Um, you know, you just wanna learn how to maximize what you have equipment wise, and that's gonna really open up the boundaries of what you can shoot with. Yes, yeah, so we have a lot of uh, you know students here that are probably interested in getting started in YouTubing, uh, but are a little shy. So I have a question here related to that and that is what advice do you give for someone who can't has camera anxiety uh, you know you have such a good presence you know how do you do it so that's that's honestly time uh live streaming has definitely opened up a different avenue of me having to kind of relearn things because there is one shot i now think i should have put in the presentation of what my actual timeline on my adobe premiere setup looks like i will do a segment of a video that's raw uncut 12 minutes and I'll cut it down to like six or seven because there's either that many screw ups in what I'm trying to say or there's dead space or whatever. And I try to obviously shorten my videos like I mentioned in the beginning that for camera anxiety, you really just have to do it. This to me, I try to treat it as I'm talking to a person and that's really it. You wanna come across that you're invested in what you're trying to talk about or sell or discuss. And so that's something that I've been in sales kind of all my life. Um, I've worked at shops at a sales position. I've done other things. I've managed shops. I've my last job was I was a sales rep. So that is something that definitely has helped this. And after that, it's really just being okay with looking into a lens, knowing you're not talking to a physical person. I mean, that's really all, all that it is. Some people get really anxious about it. And I totally get that. But it's something that you just got to try. You just got to eventually, you'll kind of get over it. Some people really need to script things out. I usually just use like a light bullet point structure of what I need to get across for really important key points or facts or pricing for items. Those things that you can't really ad lib, those are things that I'm going to write down and make sure that I, I physically say. But besides that, I'd, I'd hope that it would be come across as a communication you'd have with someone you're trying to learn something from. And that's essentially what I try to make all my videos about of getting people excited and, and learning the nerdy technical side of cycling. Uh, I build series, I do DIYs. And so it's just me talking to somebody, getting them into the sport that I've been invested in uh, for, yeah, 10 ish years now. Yeah, there's like, uh, you know, so many great channels out there, but you know, you can, you know, find really high quality content. And I think finding like a, a niche or like if you're a creator, is pretty important. Uh, sure. Any advice on networking with other YouTubers, get in your name out there. So honestly, uh, mech monkey, uh, that is something that I've recently been doing a lot more of. Obviously again, this is my full-time gig. I've been mainly reaching out to companies, uh, to try to initiate product as well as offering this as an additional thing that they can do with me. Um, but I know all my stats and I know what my rough, you know, monthly view time is or watch time, unique views, as well as obviously my current subscriber count. So that's something I pitch saying, hey, do you wanna join me on, uh, you know, I'd love to review this product. If you would love to do a live stream with me, you know, this is the kind of format, I'll send them an example video and a vid uh, link to my channel to show them, you know, if you wanna talk directly to your potential customers, I'm offering you a platform to do that. As far as collaborating, like doing like video content like I did with Zach, honestly, that's just reaching out. That's just sending a simple message or a DM on Instagram, or if they have a work email, an email directly saying, hey, this is my idea, I'd love to work with you. And, and worst case scenario, they say no, or they don't answer and you move on. You get, you know, you gotta throw a lot of info and, and things out there to try to get 
And hopefully at the end of the day, yeah, if you end up with 10% yeses, hey, that's 10% more than you had at the beginning of the day. So that's kind of what you got to do. But obviously, if you're wanting to work with somebody who is either more established than you or less established, offer up an idea. Don't just say, hey, I'd love to collab. Thoughts? Question mark. Give them something. Let them, you know, inspire them or give them an idea of like, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. And this is my idea for a video. I'd love to work with you because you do this very well or whatever. Give them kind of a, a rough idea so that they can get ideally excited about doing it. When I reached out to Zach to do a collaborative bike review, it was because we both had the same bike. I said, hey, I'm going to be in your area. Are you available this day to this day? Because he's in NorCal and I'm in SoCal. And I said, I'd love to shoot something uh, with you because we've both had the same bike. I think people would love to see that if we can. And it worked. You know, we basically met up, had lunch, kind of chit chatted a little bit about what we wanted to do, filmed that video in a hotel room that I was uh, staying in. And, you know, I edited my video and he edited his and it was it was fun. We hung out for the, the rest of the day. So knowing that time was constrained, obviously I would have loved to ride with him or whatever, but I didn't have my bike. I couldn't bring it. I had to fly out there, things like that. So we couldn't have done what I ideally wanted, but I made the best of it. Yeah, very welcome. Yeah, I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is the amount of time that goes into things like editing. So mm -hmm. what would you say it takes you to do like a, a 10 minute video? So bike reviews would be the, the pro probably like the, the most time consuming because I'm doing. I have to ride the bike to get an idea of like if I like it and why uh, I have to. I'll usually go out for the first day when it's brand, brand new and go out for a short ride and then go shoot my beauty shots of it like that you saw in the video that I played. And then subsequently over all of the next handful of rides that'll have it, I'll do one thing per ride. So I'll do one ride where I'm just bringing my GoPro so I can do all my POV stuff. And then I can do one ride with just my Osmo. And then I make sure that like a buddy of mine is with me for the next ride so that they can shoot me, you know, with uh, me all riding the bike for dynamic shots. So all in considered, like filming time, I'd say, you know, for a bike review or something substantial like that, four or five hours at least uh, of just filming um, or being outside and going somewhere or going to a cool area that looks good or whatever, making sure to ride at sunset so the lighting is nice. Uh, five to, you know, five to seven hours, I could say. Then editing wise, you know, physically doing my piece to camera for a 10 minute video, yeah, it might be a 15 or 20 minute on raw clip. And I've learned some tips and tricks over the years of, of how to make streamline that process and cut out a lot of stuff. But it really just depends if I can nail it and and just be in the zone. I could see a couple of hours to, to get all the, the talking section roughed in, cutting out what I don't like, moving things around. Cause sometimes I'll, I'll film something and remember something I want to mention in the beginning of the video at the end of the video. Um, so I'd say an hour to two hours to rough in the audio. Uh, then I start basically importing all of my extra clips and adding them over areas that make sense of, you know, if I'm talking again, talking about breaking, I need to find that breaking shot that I did and then pull that over. So all in like a bike review video probably takes me I don't know, 10 hours. Uh, some product videos are a lot easier and I've learned how to streamline it again, having that B camera shoot like the product in my hands at the same time that I'm talking about it essentially shooting all my beauty shots, my close ups at the same time. So that streamlines that process. Um, so trying to learn how to be more effective and time efficient now, because obviously I'm trying to pump out more volume, but trying to maintain the quality. Uh, yeah, burnout is definitely a thing. Uh, again, I used to take, you know, time off. I used to have my seasons off or whatever summers off, you know, and, and I would film a lot during those, but I wouldn't feel anxious or tied to a schedule to where what I then started doing is again, learning how to be more efficient is trying to shoot a lot of content and edit stuff in chunks. And so I'd be having like a really, really solid, intense, busy week. But ideally at the end of that week, I'd have, you know, at the time I was only doing a video a week. So if I could do four videos in one week, I'd essentially have next month off or done. So I would basically get really into it, do as much as I can build out my schedule and schedule stuff accordingly that way that if I needed a week or just felt like I didn't feel like editing or filming that day or wanted to go on a ride and not vlog it, like I'm good. My content's created. So if I want to make extra stuff and, and I really like that ride and I feel like in the mood to do that, 
that's how I do it. So I try to basically, you work hard, uh, just like you do at a normal job, uh, and know that you have a vacation coming if you want it. Uh, that's kind of how I, 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 how I manage it. But definitely there are a lot of times when I go out riding where I'm just like, man, vlogging this whole ride or filming it is going to just be taxing. I just want to enjoy it. And then I, I won't do it. Um, so now my kind of mantra is if I've done the ride or vlogged it once, I'm not going to do it again so I can enjoy it the second time around. Or if it's something new that I really want to enjoy the first time to see, Hey, is this trail? Like, would this be a cool story? Is the views really nice or anything like that? I'll ride it, enjoy it for what it is. And then if I want to go do it again, okay, the nuance is gone. So now let's maybe make something out of it. But it's definitely something you have to find your level of motivation for my, you know, content that I make, like getting cool new stuff to review is motivating. Uh, for me to make something if I'm really excited about uh, a product that, that's coming in. So uh, we are getting close to uh, the end of the time frame uh, that we have here. I just want to encourage if there's any last minute questions, get those in the chat. Make sure that uh, you know you feel like you've participated and got your uh, questions answered. Uh, I would think like what was like probably one of the you know most difficult things like recently that you sort of experienced, you know, is YouTube changing the algorithm any? Is it hard to get things up? What kind of strategies work to get your videos noticed? Those kinds of things will probably be important for any student that's gonna run out this weekend and start a channel. Sure, uh, I tell people this every single time they say, oh, I, I wanna start a channel. Do it, that's what I just tell them. Just do it, but do it for the right reasons. You're gonna realize very, very quickly that it has to be a passion project. I have done this for a long time. If I didn't have the rebrand that I had, I think I'd be a lot, I, this, this full-time thing would have been more actually sustainable potentially years ago, but it's something you have to do for yourself. If you just want a creative outlet and you want to make something, or you think you're offering something great to the community that you're speaking to do it, but realize this is not, you know, the, the, the get rich quick, you know, outlet or anything like that. Can your viral or video go viral? A hundred percent is the likelihood that's going to very high. No. Uh, so do this for you. If you want to do it, do it for you and just put something out there. Don't expect any kind of views. You know, I put videos out that I think don't, aren't going to do super well and they do like phenomenal. And then I'll do videos like, oh man, people are going to love this. Everyone's going to watch this and it doesn't do so great. So learning that I do this for me, obviously it is now a source of income. So I'm, I'm doing more volume and trying to keep the quality up. But there's really no code to crack. Unfortunately, you can watch hundreds of videos on the YouTube algorithm. And I've trust me, I've done it. There are things that I've learned that seem to help a little bit, but there's no like, this is always going to hit this is always going to be a, a banger. And this is going to get 100,000 views every single time. You just don't know, uh, you're going to find your kind of niche if you have videos that do well, because if it's the certain subject matter or style, start doing more videos like in that style or about that subject matter. And that's that's, you know, something that you're going to learn as you go, but you're never going to find those things out if you just don't do it. Yeah, I really encourage folks just to start out, you know, see how, how it's going for you, you know, figure mm -hmm. out what seems to resonate with people. Um, and I think Michael's given us a lot of really good, you know, tips and advice. And he does a lot of these kind of Q&A sessions, at least more recently on his channel. So you know, I'm a big fan of him continuing to do that. And I just wanted to say thanks for yesterday. I think it was yesterday's stream or maybe two days mm -hmm. ago where you gave a little shout out to us that you're doing this session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you for your time. Everybody have a great day. Take care. So thanks for watching all that. If you stuck it till the end, I really do appreciate it. And again, all my links for everything to support this channel are in the links below. And if you want to start calling me Professor Locked In, I'm okay with that. But lastly, thanks for watching this episode of Locked In. Mm -hmm.